keep your pencil sharp and master your craft, right? Um, so that way, when you're in a customer house, you know what you're doing. It, it reflects good on all of us. Um, also, shout out the TMM Academics. Uh, we got Richard and Brother B here. Um, and they have a very successful uh, school. I've been there, I, I, I visited myself. Uh, actually, the background right there where, where, uh, where Brandon is. They have a school. Oh, look at that signage. I mean, I mean, that's you know, <laughs> <laughs> that is beautiful. Um, they have machines in the background, so they are a a uh, appliance school. Um, I want to let them let them them tell you more about that. Uh, but these schools exist. You know, anybody that you know on social media, you post, oh, they should bring more more uh, skilled trades to schools and stuff. Well, these places exist, uh, and so. We're here to bring bring them to you. Uh, we're doing a seal systems class, and fellas, this is uh, we, we're going over the basic. What's the the uh, gives a bit of a cliff note on what we expect for today. Good morning, all. How's everyone? Um, my name is Brandon. Um, thank you, Encompass Parts Solutions. Thank you, Reggie, for inviting Richard Zilka and I. We are on behalf of TMM Academics. We are a uh, virtual and hands-on training center for appliance repair. Uh, today's class will be intro to SEAL system. My co-instructor's name is Richard. He will be doing most of the presentation and I will be offering any hands-on demonstrations or answering any questions. Richard Zilka, please introduce yourself. Hello, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Um, we got a lot of material to cover in, in a short period of time, so whenever we're ready, we'll we'll get going. Well, Richard, I gotta ask, brother. That looks like the most manliest garage I've ever seen, man. What, what's, what's that? <laughs> oh, that's a, that's that's just my spare office, you know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice. Man, it looks like you got everything you could possibly need back there, brother. Dude. How many years of accumulation did that take? That that's a virtual background. I I actually Yeah. I I actually use that background in one of my videos too. Uh, uh the one on copper tubing bending. Um but uh, is yeah. Like a photo you took or is it something you found? I found it on the internet. I just typed workshop and got it off the internet. Yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta search, but I didn't know they had all type of uh, like blue collar backgrounds like that, man. <laughs> you know, like a house with a like a, you know, a house with a pool in the background. You're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, well, like me, I got my warehouse, but y'all can tell I'm virtual. I'm not glitchy. So, uh, yeah, that's awesome, brother. And uh, brother B, the beard game is strong on you, brother. So we know we are gonna learn something today. <laughs> Yeah, I know you learn so much about a strong beer like that. So, no, today, today's class uh, for the folks in attendance is going to be the introduction to SEAL systems. We'll be discussing, you know, refrigeration flow, a little bit of theory, some of the components. Maybe we'll get into some PSI pressures that we can check while we're out there, give us some troubleshooting tips. So it's a good introductory uh, class. Awesome. And Richard, how long have you been uh, in the business? Tell us a little bit about, about your background, who you are. Uh, I went to school back in 1981 for appliances, started working in the field at 17 for Sears in 83. Um, been working in appliances ever since, and I'm an instructor in Miami, Florida for going on my 37th year teaching appliance and refrigeration. Wow, you, you did not look old enough. You're throwing out like 83. <laughs> I feel it, so. Wow, awesome. And uh, uh, Brother B, I was in our, uh, our Florida warehouse and I saw one of your trucks. Uh, tell us a bit about your good background, brother, and what you do. Uh, well, thank you for the question, Reggie. Uh, I've been doing appliance repair 11 years. I'm a single operator. I began in San Diego. I did a year in Atlanta. And for the last about six years, I've been in Florida. So I uh, partnered with Richard, uh, began my YouTube channel about six years ago. And uh, we're trying to uh, 
carve our little uh, space in the training uh, sector of appliance repair. So we we here to offer our services to you folks. Awesome. Feel free to ask any questions, business related, anything outside of Seal System. Are just we're here to offer anything we have to you guys. How long are your classes uh, at your school? Usually, uh, what kind of classes and curriculum you guys offer? Well, we offer uh, hands-on uh, repair training. We have different uh, courses that we have. We have a seal system uh, hands-on. We have two types. We have a weekend course, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we have a, it's more advanced. And we also have a week-long course that's more basic and kind of walks you through what is a refrigerator, what is uh, evaporated till the final day? You know, you've already done everything. R600, removed compressors, evaporators, pressure che uh, check them. Like at that point, you, you are really sound in refrigerator repair, all aspects. So we have, you know, different courses, but we offer hands-on training here. Uh, we, we beg, we ask that you don't judge us. We didn't know that we would have to show this, but we just had a class and the guys didn't pick up, myself included, but kind of it looks like this. Every uh, person gets his or own individual appliance to work on. Uh, we're located in South Florida. As you see here, these guys uh, rip up the compressors, the evaporators. So we hover them, we walk them through the repairs, and we also provide the theory to why they're doing what they're doing. Awesome. Okay. Uh, well, after you learn all this seal system stuff, uh, at some point you gotta buy parts. I wonder where they can find uh, parts <laughs> for their uh, appliance repair. Uh, well, let me show you something. So, Encompass.com, right? So, uh, for those who don't know, my name is Rachel Williams. I am an Encompass uh, rep. And so my job is to help you uh, have access to original manufacturer parts, the original parts for the manufacturers. So Encompass offer that, uh, uh, on top of that, a number of services uh, such as the little things, right? That, especially me as, my, as, as being a tech, uh, love is like our 360 photos, right? So this is game changing where, so here on this pump, if this is the part you need, and sometimes you need to verify that plug is the right one, you can do a 360 photo, spin that part around, and check out the plug uh, before you order the part, right? That's game changing. Uh, we offer protection plans where you can extend past the manufacturer's warranty. Uh, that's a good, uh, good for those who have a mind for marketing. Uh, and also, if you scroll down, you will see uh, frequently bought parts along with that one. So that actually is a, is a hack for troubleshooting. Um, so if you don't have an Encompass account, it is not too late to save your business. You can contact me. My information is scrolling below. Uh, just contact me and I'll get you get you set up. Uh, if you have an Encompass account, you don't use this, you say, you know what, Encompass sucks. Let me know why. Maybe I'll fix that for you. Uh, so I'm always available 24 seven. That number there is my cell phone number. So call or all right, and with that said, I'm gonna hand it over to our presenters. Appreciate y'all for what you do. Appreciate you guys for uh, what you do for the industry. Uh, you can also catch these guys at uh, at ASTI that's coming up. Was that February? Yeah. Uh, that's in Vegas in February. Yeah, and we got some trolls in the chat. <laughs> Man, people still do that stuff? Jesus Christ. Um, I believe what he's saying is, uh, you know, he's 20, I, I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not this person's interpreter, but I believe 22 minutes, and, you know, he's probably wanting the uh, class to begin. Oh, is that what it is? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that last comment I thought was something else. Okay, I deleted it. Though. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Yeah, actually, I'm getting it now. So, 
Yeah, actually, we're kind of just let, letting people kind of pile in because we. Uh, and and, and to that individual, will say that the reason we're kind of doing this is because when Reggie put out the invitation, he was in Memphis, so it was kind of one hour behind. So, you know, we're kind of an hour early because we're on East Coast time. We're in Miami. Yeah, we we had, we had a time staff who. So, yeah, you just say it, bro. I almost blocked him. I misunderstood, but I, I didn't. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was saying this long foreplay, like we ain't into the action yet. What's what's yeah, taking? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, hey, just like when you go see Kevin Hart, right, or you go to see Janet Jackson or somebody, there's gonna be a pre. There's gonna be a, a opening act <laughs> before the main <laughs> show starts. I'm just opening the act. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over. Uh, appreciate you guys. And uh, let me take off my encompass.com. Boom. And uh, again, y'all contact me below. And hey, bro, I appreciate you guys. And I'll let you have it. Thank you, Reggie. Okay, welcome, everybody. Apologies. Uh, Richard Zilka and I are, are just simply instructors here. We don't control time or anything like that. But with that out the way, let's get right into it. Welcome to SEAL System Intro. Okay, SEAL System. Wonderful subject matter. Today's class will be held by Richard Zilk and I. Richard, can uh, you tell real fast what we're going to get into? And let's get right into it. Could you, uh, I can share my screen? Yeah. You have to hit the present button on the low, on the okay. bottom. Okay, just one second. I'm not familiar with the... Uh... Present, and then where it says entire screen. Yeah, I am. I'm doing it now. Uh, I got dual, dual windows, so I got to open up the right... Um, the right file. One second, please. Okay, is it sharing? Uh, I'll add it to the screen here. All right. So um, this this is our school. I'm gonna go past this to uh, speed up just a little bit some of the things we offer. Uh, I'll let Brand talk about it. This program uh, is the program I actually gave at the last PSA Appliance Servicer Convention in Vegas a couple weeks ago. Uh, I'm going to go over some basic refrigeration components, something simple. So some of you guys, um, you know, are like, well, this is too simple. But I'm going to get into a little bit more detail. I'm going to talk about different refrigerants. Uh, the pressures and using the temperature pressure chart, a uh, little difference between 134A and R600. I'm going to go over a little bit of the safety and tools, but not too much, and then I'll actually talk about uh, things to look for when looking for sealed system problems or how to identify where the problem is, is a regular problem like a dirty condenser or an actual sealed system problem. So. Um, did we ready to begin, Brandon? Uh, yeah, we're ready to begin. Go ahead. And if anybody has any particular question or subject matter that you'd like us to harp on, we only got about an hour and a half. So put it in the chat, and we'll try to include it in today's presentation. Go ahead, Richard. Okay. Um, so the four main parts of a sealed system. Uh, do any of you guys know all four parts that are in the sealed system? You just put it in the chat. I'll start off with the compressor. We got evaporator, condenser, and we'll call it heat exchanger, but also call it the cap tube. Those are the four main parts of the system. We're going to go over those parts uh, briefly and then we'll get into the actual. Uh, sealed system troubleshooting and everything else. Uh, starting off with the compressor, the compressor's really uh, on a standard refrigeration system, single evaporator. I'm not going to go into dual evap systems today, but if you look at a refrigeration system, a lot of people see all these tubes and everything and don't really understand what's going on with the sealed system, but you have to stop and think the compressor is the only moving part in a refrigeration system. Everything else is just tubing, evaporator, condenser. We have down here in, in the corner here is our cap tube, and it's attached to the suction line here. It's called the heat exchanger. Um, that's the only moving part. Everything else is tubing. Um, so when we go to troubleshooting, we have to determine, is it a problem with our compressor 
or is it a problem with our system? Whether we have leaks, restrictions, overcharges, undercharges, um, that's one of the things you have to uh, disseminate. And in order to troubleshoot a sealed system problem, you have to understand how the sealed system performs and how it works. Um, so here's a cutaway cut of a compressor. Uh, if you've never seen inside of a compressor, compressor has motor windings very similar to a dryer. The, the windings are right here. Um, they have a common in start and run, just like, just like any other dryer motor. Um, then we get into a little bit more complicated, like linear compressors or VCC compressors. But a compressor is nothing more than a a piston here. Uh, with a crankshaft and as it rotates the piston goes up and down and creates pressure uh, within the system. So this is the only moving part. If you look here we have the process stub in the bottom left and the suction line and our discharge line. Our discharge line attaches to this little tiny tube which is attached, you can't really see it in the picture, would be attached right here uh, to the head of the compressor where the valves are. But the suction and process tube, the word filter blocked it out, it ends right at the case. So when you are actually putting Freon in the low side of the system, it goes in here. This Freon flows all around the outside of the motor and compressor. That's one of the most important things about a refrigeration system, about being properly charged, is that unlike a dryer motor, they have like little metal pieces that act like a fan to help cool the windings down in the motor. Uh, this motor relies on the refrigerant pressure and the flow of refrigerant over the compressor to help cool the windings in the compressor. If we have a sealed system problem like low on Freon, restriction, that'll cause our compressor to run hot and cause a lot of extra problems within our system which we'll talk about. Richard. Mm-hmm. Go, go back, go back one page, please. Yes, sir. Okay, guys, I'd like to add my two cents to that. The importance of why Richard broke down what he broke down, if you notice that process stub, that's, that's that little stub over there to the left side of the compressor. When we, when we want to tap into our system to determine if our sealed system has a problem, that's where we would do it from. Now, he spoke about discharge and he spoke about suction. Just so that you have a visual, that discharge, that's the one that goes to your condenser. Write this down, what I'm telling you. If you have a pen and a paper, write this down. That line, if you put your hand on it, right, you grab onto it, just like here's the pipe, and you grab onto that and you feel it, it should feel warm at the inlet. Now, at the outlet, right there. Now, the suction should feel ambient, which is the copper tubing. Can you can you put a, a there you go, okay? So discharge, where that arrow is, it's gonna be warm, and our suction is gonna be ambient temperature, okay? Those are just little quick hacks to like understand which line is which in your compressor. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, so here's our discharge line, and it runs actually into a pre-cooler loop before it goes into the condenser, also called a yoder or hot gas loop, depending on the manufacturer. And that goes around the frame of the door, that that helps keep the uh, frame of the door where the gasket is on the freezer from sweating and dripping. Um, so uh, this is our discharge line, and then what Brandon said is this one is our suction line going in here. Now just to add one more thing, as he said, if we're gonna check the system, here's our process stub, and I'm just gonna put a P here. Uh, this is our low side, the suction and the process stub are interchangeable. Now if you look, we also have a tube coming off of our dryer filter. If we wanted to, we could access this line here to measure our high pressures in, in the system and our discharge pressure. So we can put an access valve here and an access valve here if we needed to. A lot of time most technicians do all their service through the suction line or through the process stub. Um, we got, go we ahead. got a question, we got a question. Sure. Uh, 
Can an R600 compressor own mount good, but it still be seized? It's a VSC compressor. Got 120 yeah. and 12 at the inverter. Put a new inverter and won't stop. Yes, uh, compressors are both electrical and mechanical, as you can see here. So the windings could check out good with an ohm meter, but this is the mechanical part right here. Uh, this is the crankshaft that spins around, and this is the actual piston right here that goes up and down, creating pressures. So you could have a locked up compressor, and the bottom of the compressor sits about, maybe about an eighth to a quarter inch of oil, and this crankshaft here has a small hole on the bottom of it, and as it rotates around, that rotation actually draws oil up and actually lubricates here between the crankshaft and what we call the connecting rod on the piston. And so, yeah, it could be locked up. If you got liquid refrigerant inside the system, it could lock up your compressor. If you have uh, compressor superheating, like a restriction or something in the system, then the oil could vaporize and go throughout the system, but you have less oil in your compressor now, so it could lock up. And you put VSC, uh, I've never heard of VSC, I've heard it called VCC, which is Variable Capacity Compressor. So uh, both linear and variable capacity compressors as well as this one here, which is basically the same as a VCC compressor except for the electric windings. Um, that's our next slide, by the way, talking about the different compressors. Um, that you could have mechanical problems, and, and I'll point out a problem that happens commonly with these LG linear compressors. And we apologize for those of you who came in. Uh, it started uh, early because Reggie was in another time zone when he created it. And so uh, we had 11 when uh, we only started about five minutes ago. So those of you who missed it, you didn't miss much. We just talked about what we provide. Uh, so we're going to keep moving in the sake of time and go over any components. Again, if you guys have any questions, just post it in the chat and we'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Um, here we go, we got types of compressors. Um, if, if you guys can respond in the chat, um, we got one compressor here which says LG. We have another compressor here which has a box attached to it. We have another compressor here and we have a compressor here. I'm going to say A, B, C, and D. If you guys can put in the chat, one of them is a linear compressor, one is a VCC compressor, one is a standard compressor which uses a relay and overload, and another one is called a wise motion compressor. Do any of you know what any of them are? If you could, just put the letter of the compressor and put down what type of compressor you think it is. I'll give you a few seconds to see if anybody knows any of the compressors. All right, well, I guess we'll move on here. This LG compressor is what we call a linear compressor. Uh, let me change Look, the... there, may, there may be a delay right, in, in time, so you have to give them a second. But uh, yeah, if they don't have the answer, just move on. Okay. Um, well, I haven't seen anybody post anything yet. Um, a is linear. C is standard. D is wise motion. And and, and B is VCC. Very good. Um, VCC is evident uh, with this gray box here. Does anybody know what that gray box is? <laughs> yeah, you have to give them like 10 seconds. There's a there's a delay. Okay, well, I'm going to type I'm going to type in the answers to the other two while I say uh, does anybody know what the gray box is on on the VCC compressor? Good job, Patrick. Yes, it is the compressor inverter. Um, in the bottom right, uh, Wise Motion is what they call that compressor. It is a type of um, linear compressor. This is Whirlpool's version of LG's linear compressor. They've only used it for about two years, but there's a lot of them out there. 
As a matter of fact, on our YouTube channel, uh, TMM Appliance, um, it has, we have a video where I discuss how to troubleshoot that compressor. Um, so the linear VCC standard and wise motion, linear uh, compressors, uh, their motion is very different physically from our standard and VCC. The standard and VCC compressors internally look like this. It has a crankshaft and a piston that goes up and down. The only difference is the electric windings inside of the compressor. Um, if we look here in the top left, you can see how the crankshaft is rotating and the pistons going up and down. You'll find this in the VCC compressor and a standard compressor. And in the right hand side, you'll see a example of a linear compressor and how its piston goes up and down. We have a cutaway of both those compressors here. Just this one in the bottom right is uh, opposite direction of the, of the video. Um, the only thing is with this linear compressor, it does not act like an electric motor, like, like a dryer motor, uh, like our reciprocating and our VCCs. It's more like a solenoid. When it is given power, um, in this video here, when it's given power, the piston is pulled downwards just like a water valve is open through a, a, a solenoid. And then the springs in the bottom shoot the piston back up. So LG compressors are a little bit different in design, but we have a piston that goes up and down. The um, difference though with the linear compressors is when you own them out, you will only have a reading between two of the three pins. So when you look at the compressor and it has, a th let me change the color here. When you look at the compressor and it has three pins on it, normal standard compressor would be common start a run and you would have two windings running between the two pins. But on a linear compressor, you'll have three pins, but you only have winding between two of them. And that would be the solenoid. And one thing I wanna bring up if you are changing a linear compressor, LG came out with a newer compressor to replace a majority of the ones they had prior to this one. The pin location of the winding had changed. So when you have the wire on here, let's just say it's the top and the bottom left pin is where the, where the winding is inside that compressor, that if you take and put the wires back on the compressor here, in the same exact way it was on the old one, it won't run. On the new one now, we still have the same three pins, but the position of the winding had changed and you have to rotate the plug on the compressor to make sure it works. So ohm out your prior compressor and look how that plug goes on when you're changing it. And then ohm out the replacement one. When you look at the plug on the compressor, the plug will only have two wires. Make sure the two wires are going to the two pins that have your winding on the LG or otherwise your compressor will not run. Now here is a cutaway of the compressor and talk a little bit about how the actual compressor works. In the standard compressor or the VCC compressor we have two valves. We have a suction valve here and we have a discharge valve here. So when this piston goes downward this valve will actually bend and I'll try to draw it a little bit. This valve will bend downward and as the piston goes down it's going to pull Freon into the compression chamber. As that happens the discharge valve is going to close. So when the piston goes on its upward stroke this piston, this valve here, the suction valve will close and the discharge valve will open. Does anybody know why it has this piece called a stop on top of that valve? Anybody have an idea why it has a stop? And this is important to know and to understand something called an inefficient compressor. I'll give a second to see if anybody knows what that stop is for. Remember, it takes five seconds for a delay. Yes, sir.
right, go ahead with the answer. Okay, so these valves are called reed valves, which are just basically a piece of stainless steel. And when the piston goes down, it causes this valve to bend this way. When the piston goes up, it pushes it flat again and closes it. But on the discharge valve, oh wait, essentially a check valve to keep your fridge from flowing back in the wrong way failed compressor. Not so much to prevent refrigerant flowing the wrong way. The valve itself does that, but the stop prevents that reed valve from bending too far from the compressor. So as the compressor push as the piston pushes the refrigerant up through the discharge port, this valve could get bent and then when the piston goes back down, if it gets bent, it won't seal and allow us to pull enough refrigerant in. That'll cause something called an inefficient compressor. That means when the compressor is running, our low side pressure should be lower than our high side pressure, but in this case, both pressures could be almost equal, or the high side will be a, a little bit higher than equal pressure, but not normal pressure. So we have what we call an inefficient compressor. Now, linear compressors are unique. I'm going to have to try to draw something here. A linear compressor, let's imagine this is the top of your piston, okay? And in the linear compressor, what they did is they put the valve on top of the piston. Only one valve. Where here we had a suction and a discharge valve. This piston only has one valve. And there's an opening inside the piston. So as the piston goes downward, Freon flows through the piston. And this valve bends upward and Freon comes into the compression chamber. And I'll make this the chamber here. So as the piston goes up, this valve will close and push the Freon out. So if you look here, this is the top of the piston and this is the valve. I uh, found an image where what happens if we go back to this video, look at how this piston, when it shoots upward, the top of the piston hits this plate. It is spring loaded, but it's there to reduce like the upward stroke of the piston. The problem is, is the metal on, the, on that valve gets fatigued. It, it wears the metal down and it keeps hitting the top of that, that compression chamber and that will cause the valves to crack. And so you, this is what will happen when you've got an LG compressor and you say, my compressor is running but I don't have good pressures. Maybe I have a restriction, maybe I have this or that. You could have a cracked valve in your compressor and if that happens, you lose your compression and compressors running we just need to replace that compressor now here's a normal operating cycle compressor pumps refrigerant I'm sorry compressor pumps refrigerant into the condenser it pumps vapor only refrigeration systems cannot handle liquid except for very few uh, commercial refrigeration or air conditioning systems but most units you have to have a hundred percent vapor going through your compressor if we have liquid going through the compressor with that earlier question about can a compressor be locked up even though the windings are good that could happen um, so we pump vapor high pressure vapor into a condenser which has got a lot of heat and the condenser releases that heat from the refrigerant so it's vapor coming in and I'm just gonna put a V and as it leaves the, comp the condenser, it should be 100% liquid refrigerant. That'll flow through a dryer filter. Its purpose is to protect the capillary tube. That's the skinniest tube in the whole refrigerant system. And if we have any type of uh, oil or anything flowing through our compressor or any debris in our system, the filter is supposed to protect the capillary tube because it can get restricted quite easily. So in the capillary tube, it's 100% liquid, and it enters the evaporator here as liquid, and when it leaves the evaporator, we call that the suction line, this evaporator has to release, I'm sorry, it has to absorb the heat, the condenser releases heat, I apologize. It has to release the heat that, well, I'll start all over again, I drank too much coffee. It has to absorb the heat within your refrigerator, which is going to take the liquid refrigerant and turn it to a vapor. Now, a lot of people, when they first learn refrigeration systems, 
Condenser does what? Liquid, vapor, vapor, liquid. Evaporator does vapor, liquid, liquid, vapor. Well, just think of the name evaporator. The evaporator has the word vapor right in the middle of it. So it's going to turn the refrigerant from a liquid to a vapor. The condenser is going to condense that vapor back into a liquid. This is the basics of a refrigeration system. As we have vapor, think of water. When I boil water, it turns to steam, which is vapor. So as I add heat to liquid, it's going to turn to vapor. So our evaporator acts like a pot of boiling water. Once that turns to vapor, the compressor is going to pump it into the condenser. It's going to release the heat and turn the refrigerant back to liquid. And this is going to repeat over and over again in a refrigeration cycle. Now here are some condensers that you'll see in some refrigerators. The condenser uh, in the left here is called a static condenser. You will not find any fans. This is to dissipate heat. This condenser here is a forced draft condenser. It's hard to see it. There's a fan right here which circulates air over both the compressor and the condenser to help release the heat. This is probably the most efficient condenser out of all of them. This is also a forced draft condenser. Can anybody tell me what refrigerator that this condenser came off of while I'm talking? So this condenser, if we notice, has excess lint on it. That means the condenser is not going to remove much heat and this is going to affect the cooling. And we're going to get into more detail of this towards the end of this presentation and what we need to look out for and what kind of problem will this cause. Um, so condensers, I'm just going to go fast forward through some of these things. So capillary tube and dryer filters. There are many types of dryer filters. One of the questions people ask is, um, does it matter what dryer filter I use? I don't think it matters on any refrigerant, even R600, because the materials inside the dryer filter are designed to capture moisture or non-condensables uh, that can get into your system. Um, and moisture is moisture, so it doesn't matter if it's an R134A unit or R600 unit. Notice that this one here has an access valve already on it. Those are sort of nice, so that way you don't have to add valves. We have different here where we can actually add a valve to one of the ports and add the condenser to the other port. One thing you want to know about some dryer filters is that some of them have arrows marked on them pointing the direction that the refrigeration, uh, the refrigerant has to flow through it. So always take a look at it. If it's one of these dryer filters here and you're like, well, which way do I put it? Look for an arrow on it. If it does not have an arrow or some of them have an arrow pointing both directions, if it only has a single arrow, that arrow is going to point towards the capillary tube. So it's going to always connect to the capillary tube because that is its purpose it's going to capture non-condensables and air as well as probably capture some oil that may be flowing through the system because look how small that opening is that capillary tube can get a restriction uh, very close and uh, Ivan you are correct in your answer that was a GE refrigerator very good so the capillary tube it's very important the length and diameter inside this capillary tube is very important that if you had a restriction in your capillary tube let's just say the dryer filter is attached right here the evaporator would be the other end of that capillary tube let's just say you go to a refrigerator that has a restriction and you determine the restrictions in your capillary tube well most of the time your restriction is going to be found here in the beginning of your capillary tube it's very rare if some oil or something got in there it got all the way to like three quarters of the way and it's going to stop now the reason why I point that out is if you have a restriction and you want to clear that restriction out it's okay to cut off two or three inches of that capillary tube if you have the excess length in, in the back of the refrigerator 
Um, let's go back real quick here to that first image that I had. And if you look here, you can see how much capillary tube is coiled up here. So I could cut about two or three inches. But like I said, the capillary tube is very, very important to the function of this system that the capillary tube, if you cut too much off, you're going to affect your both your high side and your low side pressures. Will it stop the refrigerator from cooling? Most likely not, but it will affect what we call the efficiency of your compressor, which means you probably uh, won't have the right pressures and the right temperatures when did in your system. So again, if you guys have any questions, just type them in, in the uh, bottom of the box. So here's a heat exchanger. Your capillary tube and your suction line are connected together. From the factory they solder the capillary tube right on the outside of this line and this is so that the condenser, I'm sorry, the capillary tube and, and the suction line can exchange heat and it helps the refrigerant as it's entering the evaporator evaporate from a liquid to a vapor and vice versa. It helps cool down the refrigerant uh, going into the compressor so that it doesn't overheat the compressor. So we already talked about this. Let's take a look at the evaporator. So we said the evaporator needs to absorb heat. Which one of these refrigerators do you think has a full charge uh, it doesn't have any sealed system problem within the refrigerator we have a b and c when we're looking at these evaporators one of the things we want to look at is something called a frost pattern but which one of these seems to have a proper charge of refrigerant when you're looking at these systems is it a b or c Well, um, B is not the correct answer. If you look closely, and I can zoom in on it, let me just erase the letters here. The frost pattern comes in here, and I know it's not the clearest image, but if you look at the tubes down here, we have about four tubes that have frost pattern on it. Uh, Yes, the answer is A, and I'll go over that in a minute, but if you see here, the frost pattern ends right about here in our system. The rest is just the aluminum evaporator. If you look in the upper right-hand side, we have frost and ice buildup, but then it stops about here. This could have more ice on it, but it looks like the refrigerator is still going through its defrost system. Your defrost heater is this dark piece right here and it looks like it melted all the ice off of here but we had excess ice up here. Both the B and C are most likely res restrictions or low charges within our system. A which says wow we got too much ice well that's most likely a refrigerator that has not defrosted but if we had a sealed system problem what we would see is we would see frost partial on it. Now the frost is telling you that the refrigerator or the freon inside the evaporator is turning from a liquid to a vapor. That is very important for you guys to, um, to notice when you're looking at a refrigerator. I have a lot of people that call me, I have my own company and they have techs call me for tech support and they're telling me, yeah Richard my refrigerator is not cooling. One of the things I want to know is how is the frost pattern on the evaporator. If I saw a frost pattern to here, what does it mean when I see the rest of the evaporator is all aluminum? The frost pattern is telling me the liquid is turning to vapor. In an evaporator, I need to see a frost pattern on the entire evaporator. If I see that the rest of the evaporator looks aluminum in color, then 
I know that there's not enough liquid refrigerant entering my evaporator and I'm not evaporating here. So at this point, the rest of this re evaporator is filled with vapor and down here where the ice is, this is where the liquid is. So you want to look at that evaporator and you want to check your frost pattern. One thing I want to say important. If you have access valves on your system and your gauges are connected, if you take the cover off of your evaporator, this will change your pressures. Do not check pressures with the cover off your evaporator. You need these fans to pull the air across the coil for your pressures to be normal. If you don't have enough heat across your evaporator, you may cause the pressures to drop lower than normal and you may think you're undercharged or have a restriction or something in the system. Last week Brother B and I taught a sealed system class and we had a guy that was charging one of his refrigerators and he had the back cover off of the condenser but the condenser was underneath the refrigerator. It wasn't in the back where you could see it and he measured the charge in and put the right amount of Freon in and the pressures were perfect. We had zero on the low side and about 125 on the high side. You came back about five minutes later, that high side went to 300 PSI. That is an indication that that condenser is running hot. The low side pressure was still somewhat normal. And what happened, because the condenser was underneath the fridge, even though the fan was running, it was not circulating air over the condenser because he had the back cover off of the unit. So airflow over both the evaporator and the condenser are very important for proper pressures. So when we check a system, we want to check electrically, are the fans running? Is the compressor running? Then we want to look at the evaporator and we want to look at the frost pattern. These are all things that we want to do before we add valves and we just start checking pressures. If I went to a refrigerator and the evaporator was totally frosted over like that, what do you think would happen to my evaporator pressure? My evapor evaporator pressure go up when I have a completely frozen evaporator like this or will my evaporator pressure go down when I have a completely frozen evaporator? Put your answer in the comments and I'll respond. So I'm going to skip some of these questions. Um, only because we have so much time and I want to cover over some material. So here is an example of water boiling. Water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But that would be way too hot for our freezer. We don't want the um, refrigerant to boil at 212 degrees. That means our evaporator temperature has to be super hot to boil the water. So one of the important things on refrigerants is we have something called a low boiling point. So those of you who answered saying that the pressure would go down, that is correct. Does anybody know why the pressure would go down? So um, these are just basic things that refrigerants need to be safe, non-toxic. Um, I know R600 isn't that safe, but it is a refrigerant that's replacing our 134A. Um, again, I'm going to move on for, for the sake that just like the refrigerant system, if you see we got water here, the sun heats up the water, it turns uh, into a vapor as heat supplied and that's what happens so this is the same as our evaporator here and I'm just going to put an E. As that vapor rises and goes higher in the sky it's going to get cool air from the uh, the higher elevation and that's going to cause that steam or moisture to condense back into a liquid which we would see as clouds and as those clouds get thicker and get darker they block out more sun then eventually it gets even colder and the clouds can't hold any more of that moisture and it comes back down to the ground as rain and then it collects into the ocean and comes back up so the refrigeration system is very similar to the water cycle where it turns to vapor and then comes back as a liquid the Freon is going vapor to liquid now in answer to my question about um, 
why uh, the pressure would go down is because the evaporator runs at about 15 minus 15 degrees below zero. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to type it in here. We're going to talk about it in the next few slides. Um, the evaporator in a 134A system is minus 15 degrees below zero. But when we have an evaporator covered with ice, ice is 32 degrees above zero. That is 47 degrees warmer. That's going to affect your cooling. But a lot of people say, well, 47 degrees warmer, if it's warmer, isn't it going to evaporate my refrigerant? No. Um, we need the air to flow directly over the evaporator coil so that the heat can be absorbed from the air. If we have ice, the Freon cannot flow through the evaporator. It's going to flow around the outside the evaporator and there's very little to no heat's going to be absorbed. So therefore, our pressure is going to be lower. And the important thing about that is just like you don't want to check pressures with the cover off your evaporator. You want to make sure that you don't have a defrost problem and you're checking your pressures. So you need to make sure that your evaporator has a decent frost pattern and that it's not frozen over. If it's frozen over, you need to defrost it before you check pressures if you think you have a sealed system problem. And that's the same with these two other images. We need to get all this ice off the tubing to know the proper pressure. Going back to where we were, um, this is just again just a comparison between the um, refrigeration system and water as it rains down and it collects through the atmosphere. So let's get into a little bit more technical stuff. Uh, in a refrigerator, a basic refrigerator, your evaporator is normally located in your freezer and we have to achieve zero degrees uh, approximately to maintain our food being frozen. Our refrigerator section is about 34 to 36 degrees. In that case, our evaporator has to be colder than zero. And that's why on a, on a previous slide I put down that we have to be minus 15 degrees below zero on our evaporator. The evaporator has to be colder than the air we're trying to get in the freezer. This is important, especially if you guys work on refrigeration systems like, okay, now I, I've done 134A for 10 years, no problem. Now they got this R600, how do I know what is a good pressure? How do I know what the proper pressure is are? What if I'm working on a sub-zero? It has two separate compressors, one for the freezer and one for the fridge. They do not have the same pressures. So we have something called a temperature pressure chart. I'm going to zoom in on it for a second. But one of the important things is, if you look here, this column here is temperature in Fahrenheit. That is the temperature of the refrigerant. All these columns here are different types of refrigerant, and this one is 134A. So one thing like water, water always boils at 212 degrees at sea level. Now it may be different if you're in Denver or something mile high, but at sea level, water always boils at 212. This temperature pressure chart is relative to uh, atmospheric pressure at sea level. So if you see here just about 0 0.1 or 0, we have negative 15 degrees. So when you're looking at an R134A system and you put gauges on there, most people know that's been working on systems for a long time, that the low side pressure should read about 0 psi. But they really don't know what that temperature is. And that evaporator has to be 15 degrees colder than the air. So if I want zero degrees in my freezer, I have to be 15 degrees colder so it'll absorb the heat. If my evaporator was zero, I'll never get the temperature of the air down to zero. Now the next thing 
and I'm going to zoom in on it now. Let's see how many of you can uh, figure this out based on the chart. Let me just expand it here. I know it's a little blurry, but I wanted to make it bigger. So if we said R134A here at 0 PSI is 15 degrees below 0, what pressure should my R600A refrigerator be on the low side? If I walked up to an R130, R600 and said, hmm, I don't know, I think I got a seal system pop, put my gauges on, what pressure am I looking for based on this chart? Take a minute and see if you can figure out what pressure should be on the low side. Minus 8 to 15. Very good. If you look right here, minus 13.7 for R600 is going to give me a 15 degree below zero evaporator. It's the same temperature of the other refrigerator that has R134A in it. So if you know the compartment you are cooling, that you would know the pressures that that compartment is supposed to be running at. Now, here's, here's another question, and I'm not going to highlight anything on here. R134A, we go to a, a sub-zero refrigerator. So that sub-zero refrigerator, and I'll just uh, draw something here. I'm just going to draw a box. Here's our refrigerator. Our sub-zero is side-by-side side and separated here. For some reason, my computer is losing its connection. Okay, so we got a compressor here. And the compressor here, this is our freezer, and this is our refrigerator. We have a freezer evaporator, which is about zero degrees in the freezer, and we have a refrigerator evaporator, which is about uh, 36 degrees. Now, 34, 36 degrees. Some evaporators have a defrost heater. But on sub-zero, some of their evaporators do not have a defrost heater. The ones that have a defrost heater will run at the same pressure a regular refrigerator run. Electrolux even sells an all-refrigerator and an all-freezer. They look identical, but one's a fridge and one's a freezer. They run at the same pressures or temperatures uh, on, on both systems. The only thing is is that the temperature control, the computer board, will shut the refrigerator off so it doesn't freeze. But they have defrost systems on the evaporator. So we can run the evaporator that cold and with a defrost system clean off all the ice and get it back to working. So if we look at a sub-zero, and I'm going to change it from 36 to 34 degrees, they don't have a defrost system. Now, one person said um, minus 14, I think, or is that, that's probably for the 600. Uh, another one said 10 PSI in the fridge. Well, if I'm running 10 PSI here in R134A, 10 PSI will put me like right about here. That'll run my evaporator at about five degrees. That's going to be way too cold and too much frost or ice is going to build up on my evaporator. Remember I said about 15 degrees colder than the temperature we're trying to reach. So if we want 34 degrees in our refrigerator, 34 minus 15 will probably put us about 20 to 22 degrees in our refrigerator section. So here's where we'd run. And if I draw a horizontal line here, if I run from here, these are the pressures I'm going to be running at. And if I look at my evaporator on the uh, 134A, I'm going to run about an 18 to 20 PSI in the refrigerator section. That's still going to produce some ice but it's not going to build up so much ice that we need to defrost it. When the compressor cycles off, the refrigerator is still only 34 or to 36 degrees here. 
it's going to cause that evaporator to naturally e defrost itself. What is the pressure of the same Sub-Zero fridge if they decided to run that fridge with R600? I'll give you guys a second to see if you can answer that one. The delay is killing me. <laughs> We're, if some of you are responding, apologize if I don't wait. Uh, I just don't want to sit there for for a long period of time in silence. But if you look at, I highlighted it for you, that R600 is going to run about 3 PSI on the low side. 3 PSI is going to be the um, very good can stand... Uh, Kent Stanson, uh, apologize if I mispronounce your name, but very good. That's going to run you about 3 PSI. So this is how we use that chart. A lot of commercial refrigeration techs that go into restaurants and stuff, they will see all different kinds of gases. And a lot of times they may run across a, a refrigeration system that they've never seen that gas before. So um, you have to be able to use this temperature pressure chart. Now did you guys know that your temperature pressure chart is also on your um, on your gauges? Let me uh, just remove this here and open up a refrigerant gauge here. So if we look here at the refrigerant gauge, and I'm going to bring this to the front. If you look at our refrigerant gauge, this one here is is 404A, R22, and R134A. These are temperatures. These are pressures. This dark blue here is pressure. This green are called vacuums. Now before I go into the temperature pressures, the low side gauge, you may hear the term called um, compound gauge and you're like comp what do you mean compound gauge well compound gauge is because everything above zero is psi pounds per square inch gauge pressure so that are that is these pressures here on the chart in the black numbers that's how we look at it here the green numbers are inches in mercury vacuum h g okay so when we're pulling a vacuum we measure it in a mercury vacuum. Uh, Brandon, uh, are you still there? It might, might be in a time delay. Um, he has a mercury... Uh, on that back table where the compressors are, you have that mercury uh, manometer, the one that... Yeah. Can, you show, can you show that mercury manometer <laughs> to people? Uh, this is how they actually measure those gauges. And while he's getting that, I do want to bring up here that when we are looking at this gauge, these inner numbers are the temperature of that refrigerant at that pressure. If we look here at 50 PSI, for example, we look here at the temperature of R134A in this light blue. We got 50 here. We got 60. This is 52, 54, 56, 58, 60. So this is 54. So that 50 PSI, 134A should be about 54 degrees. So if we go 50 PSI, um, 134A is about, well, they're saying 45 degrees. So I don't know the accuracy of that chart, but this that is the temperature at that pressure. So Brandon, can you show that? Um, so what he has there is hold a. On, hold on, hold on, hold on. You want to be the the share yeah, screen yeah, for a sec? Yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. So if you guys look at that, that that U-shaped tube. On, but then you can't talk. Hold on. Well, oh. <laughs> all right, now you can talk. Sorry. Okay, so what he's showing you is called a manometer, and this is what we used back in the day uh, to measure vacuums. The inside of that tube where his, his hand is, is filled with mercury. 
and we pull a vacuum the mercury goes up one side and down on the other and we have to count each one of those numbers can you go on just a little bit closer to show the numbers on the screen each one of those numbers are inches like the three four five and six that you see on his screen and that is the inches of mercury vacuum so when we're measuring vacuums and I talk about inches of mercury vacuum you're saying well where's he getting these inches of mercury that's what that gauge is calibrated to to measure now one thing I want to add I don't have it on the screen for those of you who use uh, digital gauges like yellow jacket um, I ran across this you know I'm old school I've been doing this for 40 years now and so uh, my meters analog my gauges are analog Brandon loves to pick on me like I use all this old school stuff um, when you are measuring with a digital meter we were pulling a vacuum in one of our classes and the gauge on the low side normally we will pull to a 30 inch vacuum like you see here um, that's when we know we've got a deep enough vacuum in the system but a digital uh, gauge only reads 14 minus 14.7 Okay, minus 14.7. So minus 14.7 is the same as a 30 inch vacuum on our gauges. So here's a question. If this is 14.7, what do you guys think uh, 10 and 20 would be? If 30 is 14.7, what would a 10 inch vacuum be on a digital meter? What would a 20 inch vacuum be on a digital meter? Give you guys a second to see if you can say 10 equals this and 20 equals that. Then I'll tell you the easy way to figure it out. <laughs> Give you guys a second to come up with an answer. All right. Um, if you haven't got it, if this is 30, 14.7 is almost what? Almost 15, right? Okay, so 10 is negative 5. Very good. What about 20? Ah, 20 is negative 10. So in other words, a digital meter is about half of what our analog is going to say. So a a 15 inch vacuum is is the same as 30 so this is going to be a 10 inch vacuum and this is going to be a 5 inch vacuum on a digital meter negative 5 negative 10 so very good for those of you who answered that so here is here is the thing EPA says okay in order for me to service a unit I have to pull a 10 inch vacuum and on an analog meter I can see this 10 right here and if you got a 10 inch vacuum or deeper you don't have to go to a 30 inch vacuum when you are recovering you have to pull a 10 inch vacuum and if it's 10 inches or lower you can open up the system for service even if it has a little bit gas left in it EPA says if you reach 10 inch vacuum on a 134A unit you could go ahead and open it for service but on our digital we're looking for a minus 5 on our digital a minus 5 on our digital and if it stays minus 5 or less that's the same as a 10 inch vacuum so if you're using digital gauges don't get confused as to the differences in our pressures and our temperatures so here uh, basically I've already gone over the information before if you know the temperature of the box so we got a unit here and we this is inside of a side-by-side -side refrigerator I want to get you know zero degrees inside I want to reach 15 below zero on my evaporator these are all the pressures those gases would have to be if I if I'm gonna use R12 I'm gonna run 
between 3 and 5 PSI. If I'm 134A, I'm going to run at about 0 PSI. And if I'm riding an R600, I'm going to run a 13 to 14 inch vacuum. As long as you understand that, that's how you know when you walk up to a refrigeration system, how do I know if these pressures are right? This is important for basic understanding of a refrigeration system and understanding what your, your gauges are telling you when you're attaching it to a system. So I'm going to skip through some of these questions because this presentation was one I gave that was four hours long. So I'm not going to go that long. We've got about another 20, 30 minutes here. So here's an example of a top mount refrigerator. I, I tried to show how air flows. One, we have air flowing through the freezer. It comes into the compartment and back over the evaporator. But we also have an opening here, which the fan will blow cold air down into the refrigerator compartment. And then there's two openings on the side that are return air vents. If any of our vents are blocked, either our supply here coming down or returns going back up, that's going to affect cooling in our refrigerator compartment. So if we were looking at a refrigerator and the customer says, hey, my freezer is cooling but my refrigerator is not, the most important thing you want to look at on this unit is airflow. Will a defrost problem affect airflow? That's a question I want to bring up while I'm talking about this. But if we have an airflow problem here, our freezer is going to cool normally, but we're going to have cooling problems in the refrigerator. I remember this goes back to the early 80s when I was fixing appliances and the customer says, oh, my, my milk is spoiling inside my refrigerator. And I would take and um, go ahead and open up the freezer to see if the fan's working and check my refrigerator, uh, I'm sorry, my evaporator for defrost. And the lady's like, no, 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 my freezer's good. The problem's in the fridge. Uh, yes, ma'am, I, I understand, but the freezer cools the fridge on most units. And I need to make sure that this is functioning properly. So I want to check my airflow. So you want to check air going in and out of the compartment. So going back to that question, will the defrost problem affect my airflow? Now, if we looked here, here's a side-by-side. -side. Air will go over this evaporator and then circulate back into the freezer compartment but we have an opening in our side-by-side -side where air comes in and it comes back down here as, as, as it passes through the system and it returns back into the evaporator compartment here to cool down. And thank you, Patrick, you are correct. A defrost problem will block the airflow going into the refrigerator compartment just like uh, the, these openings being restricted or blocked. Um, one of the important things is in this compartment here and here, we have something we call a damper. A damper is like a door or a window. Uh, down here in Florida, we've been dealing with 90 to 95 degree weather every day until last night. It actually got into the 70s last night, and I think it got even cooler today. So what are we going to do? We're going to turn off our air, and we're going to open up the windows to allow some of that cool air in so we don't run our air conditioning. Well, a damper is like that window. We open up the window that lets air into our refrigerator compartment. When that happens, the thermostat or the temperature control in this compartment, when it says, okay, we're at 34, 36 degrees, we don't need any more air, the damper can block the airflow into the refrigerator and still allow airflow in our, in our freezer compartments to cool, to cool that compartment separate from our refrigerator and to prevent freezing of our food in our refrigerator compartment. So let's take a look at some examples of problems that you may have that may look or act like a sealed system problem. We saw some of them earlier that if we have a dirty or plugged condenser if we have a dirty condenser, we're not going to dissipate heat. And I said earlier uh, in our last class that we didn't have airflow over our coils. Our condenser pressure and temperature shot way up to 350 PSI. That heat was not being released from the condenser. If that happens, we don't condense enough refrigerant from a vapor to a liquid. So when it comes into the evaporator, we're not going to absorb as much heat. Now in the picture below, 
we have a blockage, a piece of insulation got stuck in the condenser fan blade so the fan doesn't run. Both of these problems are very, very similar. The amperage or wattage of our system is going to rise when that happens because when we don't release heat, like I said, that we're going to raise the pressure of our condenser and by raising the pressure of our condenser, it's going to make the compressor work harder. Now, you're going to hear or you'll hear a technician say, you call tech support and you say, yeah, my refrigerator is not cool and the guy's going to say, what's your compressor amperage? A lot of people say, oh, about a 0.8 to a 1.0 is a good amperage draw for a compressor. That means it's, it's working properly and you got the proper uh, charge in your system. Well, that only works really with a compressor that has a relay and overload. Because our linear compressors use, don't, they don't use a, a motor winding, they use like a solenoid to pull that piston down and spring it back up. And uh, our VCC compressors and you know our, our uh, linear compressors are variable speed. So you need to know the speed that the compressor is running to even understand what the amperage draw is. So back in the day, we only had compressors with relays and overloads. So checking amperage on there was a good way to check to see if the system was properly charged or working properly. Now here you can see the condenser temperature is higher than normal. Our frost pattern, our evaporator, even though our coils are different, will look almost normal. Uh, our compressor discharge temperature, which is the line coming off the compressor, the one we have right here, going to our condenser is going to be super hot, very hot to the touch. Our low side pressure is going to be higher than normal. Why? Because the condenser didn't release the heat, that heat's going to be in our evaporator and that's going to raise our pressures on the evaporator side. Our fresh food temperature is going to be warmer than normal because we're not absorbing as much heat. And our freezer temperature is going to be warmer than normal. So if you look here, the symptoms for both a clogged or dirty condenser and a blocked condenser fan motor are going to be very similar. And you can look at both of them in a minute to see if both of them may be an issue to the customer's complaint of inefficient cooling. Now, one thing on a side-by-side -side refrigerator, I'm going to go back to this image here, is I found that out that, remember we talked a little bit about that hot gas loop. That hot gas loop comes in, goes around the freezer, and goes back down here. And its purpose is to warm up the face of this door with part of the condenser high temperature high pressure tubing to prevent it from sweating. I've had customers call me and says, man I put my hand on this mi middle strip we call the mullion strip and I'm burning myself. Well immediately I know, hey um, your problem is probably a dirty condenser, this condenser fan's not working and that's what's going to cause this thing to get excessively hot. So if someone's complaining about this wall here where the door gasket meets the frame is super hot, then go check your condenser. Check to make sure it's not dirty. Make sure your fan's working. Now on a, a top mount unit or a bottom mount unit, most of those hot gas loops only run three quarters away around the uh, unit it's very hard for them to run the line through here because of the divider separator. They usually put an electric heater, uh, similar to the dispenser heaters, inside behind the mullion strip there. Um, and all the older refrigerators, they have electric heaters around the whole box instead of the Freon lines. So let's talk about what if this condenser runs hot. Can anybody type in the comment some of the problems that could happen to a system that if it ran for extended period of time without a condenser fan, without the condenser being cleaned, like you see here, dirty as heck, um, what kind of problem could happen to a refrigerator if we had these problems in the unit? Now I'm going to go on to the next portion to see if anybody can respond and say this is what could happen if it ran like this for a long period of time. Now these, again, these are all things you want to check before you put your gauges on the system. You want to do, just do this, all these tests should only take about a minute or two uh, to check all of them. 
but you want to make sure all of these things are not happening because they have caused problems that a customer says the refrigerator is not cooling but what if the lights stayed on when the doors closed now I know some of these new refrigerators like Whirlpool they use all these LED lighting or whatever but these old school refrigerators if you ever tried to unscrew a light bulb you can burn your hand and they can put excessive heat notice here the symptoms customer had the unit open uh, for cleaning the light stayed on I've seen some units where the defrost heater um, is uh, staying on even when the refrigerator is in a cooling mode and it's going to affect the proper cooling and one weird one I had a top mount GE refrigerator the real real old ones uh, most of you guys probably have never seen them they make like almost like a, a cylinder shaped ice cube uh, that customer had a top mount unit and the ice maker got stuck and the heater of the ice maker was on all the time I burned myself accidentally touched the ice maker while trying to take the rear cover off and as I removed the ice maker the wall where the ice maker was was starting to turn yellow like it got super heated so the customer says "Oh, I don't use that ice maker and I removed it um, from the uh, unit now uh, someone said that might stop the compressor completely which is true but one of the things we want to uh, pay attention to is remember I said these compressors have a motor inside of a steel ball here we need refrigerant flow to help cool that compressor down if this compressor is running hot and excessively hot you'll have more oil in that compressor turned to vapor and you'll have more oil flowing through your system and what happens in the condenser the condenser is supposed to cool that refrigerant down and in cooling so we're gonna have excessive oil in vapor form flowing through the condenser well that oil is gonna start to cool down in the condenser and it's gonna thicken back up and so if you ever taken a dryer filter off and you got oil coming out of your dryer filter that is a sign that the condenser fan might have been bad before and someone replaced it or the condenser coils are excessively dirty and that caused our compressor to run hot and caused more oil to get in our system if that happened that could create a restriction and once that oil gets in the capillary tube now we've completely blocked any freon from flowing over our compressor it's going to run even hotter and that's going to cause a problem with our system and cause the system to superheat and more oil once it starts it just builds up like like rust or cancer it's hard to stop it if you had this problem and you had oil coming out of your dryer filter man you gotta change your compressor you might have to change your heat exchanger which is your capillary tube and you might even have to change uh, your condenser if you cannot flush it out with nitrogen to try to get all that excess oil out. I'd hate to, to change the compressor and clear out the restriction of my cap tube and as soon as I turn it on any oil that might have been in our, our condenser now just clogged our system back up. So you have to pay attention that even though we have a, a what we say a mechanical problem, dirty coils, bad fan not working, it will cause other problems such as sealed system problems down the road so if a customer waits too long to call you out or you're, you're so busy you don't get out for another week this can happen to your system so again we look for dispenser door flap not closing Whirlpool was notorious for having these plastic mechanisms for their dispensers and door flaps where your ice chute comes out like in, in this refrigerator right here your dispenser and oh this happens to be I think in a mana. Um, the door flap is on a time delay so when you pull your glass away that flap's supposed to stay open for a few seconds to allow any cubes to fall out so if the door flap closes real, real fast and a cube got stuck on the way down it won't let that door close but on the back end sometimes those door flaps the mechanism doesn't allow the door to close so we get excessive warm air going up inside our freezer and that could cause ice buildup on our damper in the wall so if you go into a refrigerator the customer's saying hey my refrigerator side's not cooling and your damper 
has got frost on it look at your dispenser door flap or your refrigerator door gaskets and see if any of them are allowing excess heat or moisture from getting into your system and cause this ice buildup so uh, this is another unit if you look one of them's a refrigerator and one of them's a freezer the customer has an upright freezer on the left hand side a lot of these upright freezers the condensers in the wall of the in the unit not on the bottom and if it's in the wall if you look they got a bunch of crap piled up against it and another refrigerator piled up against it warm wall condensers in chest freezers like we reach down in them and upright freezers the condensers on the side of the refrigerator you can put your hand on there and feel the heat of the condenser just by touching the outside wall of the fridge but if they got all this junk piled up against it how is it going to release the heat properly this is going to cause this unit not to properly cool it will cool but again you're going to cause problems with your compressor so if you look at the at the light being on or excessive heat we have higher wattage, higher than normal condenser temperatures, higher than normal compressor discharge. Everything's higher than normal when we add excess heat to the box by something external, door gaskets, uh, ice maker, defrost heaters, lights staying on. Now on this one, again, everything's higher than normal when you have the condenser in the wall and you're not dissipating that heat. So if we look at these units here, blocked evaporator fan. Now this is probably a sealed system problem. Why? Because if we look at the bottom half of this evaporator, there's no ice or frost. So the evaporator is probably defrosting, but it may have a sealed system problem causing excess ice to build on the top and the defrost heater cannot remove it when it gets so thick so it'll block the fan from running and again the first thing that the customer is going to say is my refrigerator side is not cooling unless it's a dual evap system now if you look at down here we have an iced up evaporator this is going to block our airflow so let's take a look at the upper one if we look at the upper one here where we have a, def a sealed system problem or blocked evaporator fan here that our amps are going to be low why? Because we're not pulling enough heat across the coil if our fan's not working. Our condenser's going to be low because we don't have enough heat. We will have a suction line frost back. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a picture of it here, but I will show it to you in another image. If your suction line is frosting back, we could have some problems. We'll get into that one. Lower than normal temperatures in the whole box. Warmer than normal on the fresh side lower than normal pressures on our gauges because we don't have enough heat. If we have a frozen evaporator, we're going to have very similar symptoms to a blocked evaporator fan. We're going to have lower than normal temperatures and lower than normal pressures. So let's look at actual sealed system problems. So those are the things you want to check before you go into a sealed system. These are actual things that would be a sealed system problem. Overcharge and undercharge is very rare that this is going to happen from the factory. This is usually happen due to someone prior to you coming out either added too much Freon when they charged it or didn't have enough Freon in the system when they charged it. Um, a low side leak could have some refrigerant still left in the system or no refrigerant left in the system. Either way, it's going to have a, a, a cooling effect, but you're going to have different pressures on those two, and we'll talk about them as well. You could have a leak on the high side. A low capacity compressor or inefficient compressor, I showed you an example of that, like the valves going bad. One of the valves could be bent and allow the compressor not allow the compressor to build up pressure or the valve could be damaged on the piston or the piston itself could be damaged um, and it will not pump the refrigerant through you could have a restriction in your cap tube or you could have a floating restriction a floating restriction i've never really seen it 
but that's like it's got a restriction in the system the customer loses cooling you come out there and the unit's cooling just fine it's hard for you to tell a floating restriction unless you show up to the unit and you actually see that it's not cooling and you put your gauges on it and your pressures indicate that you have a restriction so let's take a look here of symptoms an overcharge in a system will cause frosting back to the compressor why because we flooded the evaporator with so much freon it cannot turn to vapor in the evaporator 100 percent so we're still getting liquid refrigerant coming back to the compressor and remember at the beginning i said when we look at an evaporator we want to look at frost pattern frost patterns tell me liquid freon is turning to vapor an overcharged system like this means that liquid is coming back to your compressor and we could damage the valves in our compressor don't get fooled that if we have a defrost problem or the evaporator fan is not working we will not turn the freon in the evaporator to 100 percent vapor and we could also see a frosted suction line so we want to look at the system and make sure that it's defrosting and that our evaporator fans working then if I see frost on my suction line I'm gonna go into my system but I'm not gonna go into the system until I checked defrost and the evaporator fans working if we have an overcharge we have higher amps or wattage on the compressor because we're, we're pumping liquid refrigerant through it is making it work harder our condenser temperature is going to be higher than normal. I gave an example here of your, your high side pressure is higher than normal. should be somewhere about 125 to 130 on the high side. And our low side pressure should be running at zero. Here we're running about 15 to 17 on our low side. And overcharge, all of our pressures would be higher than normal. And here we'll have frost on our suction line. Um, and here equalization will take a little bit longer than normal because we have too much refrigerant in the system and undercharge if you look only partial frost is appearing on our evaporators for you guys who really can't see too good I can bring the picture a little bit larger and you can see that the suction line has got frost on it up to about this point and undercharge will cause that but a partial restriction will also cause that but an undercharge if you look the two key things is that our condenser temperature is lower than normal that our high side and low side pressures are lower than normal if you see that our 134a system is going to be run into a 10 inch vacuum our high side pressure is just going to be about a hundred psi about 90 psi so that our pressures are both lower than normal if I had a restriction our, our high side pressure will not be that low if we look here a low side leak with some refrigerant in the system and a low side leak with no refrigerant let's take a look at a couple of things physically low side leaks may look the same but if we have some freon in the system let's take a look at the symptoms I'm gonna bring this to the front so you guys can read it if we look here our low side leak in the system our low side pressure is normal to slightly higher and our high side pressure is lower than normal so why would if, if I had a leak in the system normally a leak in the system would be like this and I'm gonna bring this one to the front if we look at our pressure we're, we're almost at a 30 inch vacuum and our high side is at 150 well, let's look at this gauge for a second we're running we're we have a low side leak but we're running a 10 inch PSI not zero and our high side pressure is a little bit higher than normal why is this why is if we have refrigerant in the system on the low side leak that means our evaporator or something on our low side has a leak and it's sucking moisture in so why are the pressures different on these two low side leaks and I'm gonna put them side by side so you can see them 
that the one on the right is a low side leak with no refrigerant and the one on the left is a low side leak but there's refrigerant in the system why would the two low side leaks look different from each other has anybody got an answer for that one Now, if anybody's typing, I'm I'm just going to go through because we're running close to the one o'clock uh, end end time, and I'm almost done with the presentation, so I want to be able to finish it up. If you have a low side leak, and the one here, this one has refrigerant still in the system, a low side leak normally the refrigerator runs at zero psi. So if I leak a little bit of freon, that evaporator now is going to suck air and non non-condensables and moisture into the system. When you mix that with the refrigerant, let's see, someone said, because the amount of refrigerant of, or moisture, the moisture is going to increase the pressure as it's mixed with the refrigerant, so both our high and low side are going to be a little bit higher than normal. When we look at a system that has no refrigerant in it, well now we lost the refrigerant, which is what's creating our pressures. Now we just got air and non-condensables in our system, but a majority of that moisture is going to be trapped in our high side, and that's why our high side is going to be running high, but our low side is going to be in a vacuum. So now what if we have a high side leak? Well, a high side leak, and I'll bring this one to the front, a high side leak, the amperage is going to be low, the condenser is going to be low, the liquid level is low, there's going to be little or no frost pattern at all on the system, the condenser and compressor is going to run cooler, the low side's in the vacuum, you can see here we're 10 inch in a vacuum, the high side pressure is going to be lower than normal until eventually we're out of Freon. But if we're a high side leak, then all the freon is going to leak out. Very little moisture or, or non-condensables are going to suck in. Because if we have refrigerant in the system, when the compressor shuts off, it's going to have positive pressure throughout the system. It's going to reduce moisture getting sucked in, unlike a low side leak, where it could suck moisture into our system. So here, if we have a low capacity compressor, which is what we talked about earlier, our symptoms on a low capacity compressor uh, is this here. Our low capacity compressor, our high side is going to be lower than normal. We're here, we're running about 75 psi, and our low side here, this is 10, 20, 30, 40. We're running just under 50, and that's because the compressor or the valves are bad and they're not allowing for the compressor to build up that higher pressure. So everything is lower than normal or cool, cooler than normal, like as if this valve was broken or one of these valves were bent. So here we have capillary tubes with a partial or complete restriction. First let's talk about a system with a complete restriction. Um, let me bring this to the front. A system with a complete restriction. A lot of people expect a couple of things on a complete restriction. The low side's going to pull down be lower than normal. The vacuum level depend for how long. But the high side's only at 50. Now a restriction means that the system still has all of its freon. Wouldn't you think that your high side pressure if you had a restriction, the, the compressor would suck everything from your low side, put it into your high side, wouldn't that raise your high side pressure? Why is the high side pressure only 50? Why is it not even normal? Um, I'm uh, recording this and I haven't talked to Brother B, but uh, I don't know if Encompass is going to post it on their site. 
but this class is being recorded so we can post it on our YouTube channel and I'm gonna have brother B talk a little bit about our school and our, and our and our channel that you guys can check out when we're done maybe he can share uh, screen share our website and our YouTube channel if you want to prep that on your computer brother B where I'm coming close to the end of this class um, so uh, in this system if we look at at these gauges our high side pressure only became 50 uh, the question was, why is it not 200? Because if, if I got a restriction, I'm taking everything from the evaporator, I'm pumping it into the condenser. Wouldn't the pressure of my condenser go up if I keep pumping Freon into it? The answer is yes and no. When you first turn on a system that has a restriction, especially if you're adding Freon, your high side pressure will climb higher than normal when the compressor is pumping the Freon in because as it's pumping the Freon in it's pumping vapor which is heated refrigerant so heat and temperature and pressures go together I showed you on that chart so yes as I pump in it's gonna go high once the condenser cools the refrigerant down it's gonna release all that heat it's going to just be like your Freon tank. If you look at our temperature pressure chart, R134A at room temperature is almost the same as, as the pressure, 70 PSI, 70 degrees. So our condenser, once all the heat's released, the condenser becomes like a Freon tank. It just stores the Freon. So when we first turn it on, we're going to see the pressure go high, then the pressure is going to drop. Our low side is going to pull almost to a 30-inch vacuum. Now, on a capillary tube, that was a complete restriction. On a capillary tube with a partial or floating restriction, then it's going to be uh, very similar, a deeper vacuum on the low side, very similar to our complete restriction, but you have to catch it. A floating restriction means it blocks up the capillary tube, but the compressor was able to pump enough pressure to pass it through and now if it didn't get caught by the dryer filter or something it's going to float around the system and then block it up again so a floating restriction is a restriction that may appear or disappear within the system so that's pretty much it I'm not going to go over the chapter questions um, what you saw here today guys real quick and then I'm going to let brother B talk a little bit more about our program and if he could share our YouTube channel and our website this is part of an online system that we're building a um, a online learning where you could go through these chapters answer questions and take tests and we'll provide a certification for that right now there's a beta version available for all of our members on our site and Brandon will talk to you about our membership um, the other thing is uh, we do have with our membership and, and Brother B will talk about our bi-weekly classes where we do classes like this every other Saturday. Sometimes they're on schematics and troubleshooting. Sometimes they're on sealed system. Sometimes they're actual hands-on demonstrations, how to change a compressor. Uh, and so check out our YouTube channels and everything else. So if you guys have any other questions to the presentation or comments, we'd be happy for you to post them in the bottom there. And, and I'm going to let Brother B take over and uh, share a little bit of our site uh, real quick. But just before he does that, on our presentation here, um, we have a brochure here uh, that I have on a, on a presentation. Let me just get to the first screen here. Uh, this is our brochure and talks a little bit about um, our classes and where we're located. And again, this will be posted in the video online. And then Brother B, if you could uh, take over and, and share with, with everyone a little bit about uh, our classes and, and what we do. All right, guys, so I want to thank Richard for an amazing training. We hope that you guys all benefited from it. Uh, but guys, the truth to the matter is, it's only so much that we can do in two hours. But if you like subject matter like this, uh, and you would like further uh, training, we also have our hands-on training facility. Right now, I'm currently in it. 
Uh, it's a large shop, right? It's a little messy just because we were doing some work here in the lab. But uh, guys, come on down to South Florida. You can check out our website, tmmacademics.com. If you see here, uh, here's our, our website. Uh, we got a couple different um, uh, options. You can do a self-study where Richard Zilka, much like the course that he went over today, it's a self-paced, self-taught course. Uh, we also have hands-on training where uh, gives you kind of our dates. Uh, we got a R600 class coming up. That's a three day. We got a, we even teach in Spanish. We got a December class. We got cook in January, laundry. So again, guys, uh, also, if you want to find out more about us, uh, you can check us out on YouTube. Just go on over to TMM Appliance Network. Uh, on there, you'll see videos like uh, earlier where Richard goes into uh, these sorts of lectures. Uh, again, you can check out some of our other SEAL system videos. Uh, if you want to get into like, like other appliance repair, uh, repair training, uh, there are various videos here. So again, uh, if you want to support us, go on over to YouTube, TMM Appliance Network. And if you want more information about our uh, facility, go on over to, I'll put that in the comments section. Here and let's go Brandon, here. Brandon, can you hear me? Here, boom. All right, so I'll just put that in the comment section. All right. And uh, we'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, we'd like to thank the fine folks of Encompass for allowing us to host. Bring Richard Zilka back on here. And uh, thank you, Richard, for uh, that wonderful lecture. Does anybody have any final questions? I do want you to add two things. One, to talk about Voxer, and to also that we have a member section of videos that are that are not in our public YouTube channel. If you want right, to tell, so them, we, tell them about we Voxer. Have, they, we do have, if you're interested, a uh, walkie-talkie application that you download on your phone, and it pairs you with other technicians across the country. We currently got a few hundred members so if you sign up and you're out on the job, you get on that application and you get real-time troubleshooting from other technicians who are part of the group as well. Also, every other weekend, we do have these uh, trainings just like we did today. So if you're interested in those virtual trainings, you can also check those out there every other weekend. We have a ton of pre-recorded videos on there so you can kind of binge watch for days and uh, get a bunch of uh, videos and a bunch of training on there. Uh, thank you to Mier, thank you to Rashima, thank you to 